So today's video is going to be a bit different from the usual. As a writing channel, I usually have some form of writing discussion, but today we're going to talk a little bit more about the importance of good diverse representation in our writing. And we're going to do it by getting really nerdy about Avatar and autism. Back in 2022, I stumbled across a Tumblr post in which the writer explained all the reasons they had canoned a popular Avatar character as autistic. And once I'd seen it, I could not unsee it. I decided I wanted to re-watch the series and discover if there were any other symptoms I could find that this character displayed. And boy, were there. So I did what any sane person would do, and at the end of 2022, I made a 40-minute video nerding out over what I'd found. But I never published that video. Videos about autism all too often attract a nasty crowd I didn't particularly want to share company with. But with the Netflix adaptation making Avatar a popular topic again, I thought it could be fun to go back and gush over the original series. So we're gonna give this video a try. However, due to the sensitive nature of this topic, I do have to lay down some pretty firm ground rules, and I will be stricter in moderating the comments section on this video. So, first, a reminder that this is a headcanon, and you are still free to have your own headcanon about this character. Second, autism is a spectrum. No, not like that. Like this. People aren't really a little or a lot autistic, that's not really how it works. They're just autistic. Or not. But how an autistic person expresses their autism and how much support they need is unique to each individual. That means that while a lot of what I'll discuss today are pretty common traits of autism, for every single trait I discuss, there will be autistic people who have seemingly opposite traits. Third, I have left a link to the Tumblr post that inspired this video down in the description box. I'm adding quite a lot of my own observations to theirs, but several of the points made in this video were made first by them, and there are other examples they gave that I didn't address in this video, so I highly recommend reading their post for a full picture. Lastly, before we introduce this character and anyone attempts to tell me that the writers never would have intended to code them as autistic, I know. I can explain the likely reasons the writers included nearly every trait that we'll discuss, but that doesn't mean this character wasn't still coded as autistic. So with that in mind, let's finally take a look at this old video of mine, and using my version of This Autism Wheel by Matt Lowry, let's discuss the autistic traits of Zuko. Interoception deals with abnormalities in an autistic person's ability to sense aspects of their own physical and mental state, such as their emotions, hunger, or pain. They may experience too much pain for small injuries, but have high pain tolerance for serious ones. We know that Zuko, despite Iroh's warnings, began his search for the Avatar very soon after having had half of his face melted off. We see a similar thing after Zuko's ship exploded. Yet, this is how he reacts to being bitten by a measly turtle duck through his shoe. I don't know, maybe the turtle is a snapping turtle duck. Several times, Iroh reminds Zuko to eat and to rest. When Zuko does admit he's tired, it's clear he's far beyond tired. It's a recurring problem for Zuko to forget to take care of himself. Zuko also has a lot of difficulty understanding his own feelings. Learning to separate his emotions from what he thinks he's supposed to feel is part of his character arc. When he's pressed about what he's feeling toward whom in the episode The Beach, he expresses confusion and struggles to respond. With those examples, I think it's safe to add a few bars to this wedge. The stereotype of the emotionless, autistic robot is just that, but it can seem true because some autistic folks have low affect. Whatever they feel inside, they may not show it on the outside in the way that neurotypicals expect them to. Many have pointed out Zuko rarely smiles and only laughs, I believe it's twice. Outside of moments of extreme emotion, he doesn't tend to express emotion as noticeably as most other characters, nor does he express as wide of a range of emotion. Autistic people often have trouble regulating their emotions too, which can lead to meltdowns or to shutdowns, where they stop speaking or interacting until their emotional state rebalances. They're also more prone to anxiety and depression. And we see all of these in Zuko. 
The most obvious is Zuko's explosive temper. He seems to be in a near constant state of dysregulation and has a bit of a meltdown whenever he's had one annoyance too many. But Zuko also goes into shutdown mode. He may seek to be alone in the quiet and dark. In other words, he seeks sensory deprivation. And if someone interrupts, he might not speak to them or even acknowledge them at all. No eye contact, nothing. And Zuko's agonizing over making friends, his overthinking, and lines like, I'm never happy, show Zuko experiences anxiety and depression-like symptoms too. Autistic people are also known for having atypical empathy, which can present in many ways, but in Zuko's case, he seems to have high emotional empathy and low cognitive empathy. Emotional empathy is the ability to sense and be affected by others' emotion. I would argue that, save Katara, Zuko has the highest capacity for emotional empathy of the gang. The episode The Southern Raiders takes several minutes of runtime to depict how distressed Zuko is that Katara is upset. The reason I say he has the second highest emotional empathy is that others have known about Katara's trauma for as much as two and two-thirds of a season, but done nothing about it. Yet Zuko only has to be on Team Avatar for a few episodes before he's distressed enough by Katara's state that he's like, nah, we need to fix this yesterday. Cognitive empathy, however, is understanding why someone is feeling the way they are, and being able to predict how someone will respond to certain stimuli, such as telling them they look fat in that dress. Autistic people may have a delay in developing this empathy, which is why they might seem rude sometimes. Again, in the Southern Raiders, Zuko is distressed that Katara is upset, but it takes several steps to understand why. There's also this. He clearly knows Sokka is acting strangely, but his responses to both Suki and Sokka indicate he's missing cues that they were planning for alone time. He was too focused with what's on his mind. Hyperfocus is also an autistic trait, by the way. And here are several other examples of his low cognitive empathy. Finally, studies show that autistic people are more likely to hold true to their moral compass in public and private, regardless of the opportunity for personal gain. They may have a black and white sense of right and wrong, a strong sense of fairness, justice, or, dare I say, honor. As other Avatar fans have pointed out, Zuko is the only honorable party in all three of his Agni Kais. Zuko adheres to the rules of the Agni Kai even when no one else does. And he can say all he wants that his men don't matter, but when push comes to shove, he will speak out on their behalf or risk his life for them. He is also protective of his own enemies and his nation's enemies, even if it means going without food when he's starving, risking exposing his identity, or risking the stability of the Fire Nation itself. In fact, when the writers want to show you just how close Zuko comes to the dark side, they do it by having him break this moral code. It's that big a part of his character. So yeah, I'd say it's safe to give Zuko quite a few bars on this one. Autistic communication is often unique from allistic communication, and surprise, Zuko has a ton of autistic speech traits. First, Zuko tends to take people literally. He also tends to take them at their word. Zuko has to remind himself that Azula lies, yet multiple times in the series he believes her anyway. He's surprised to learn that she was dishonest, but she admits that she's done this to him before. Zuko has difficulty with holistic humor. He attempts one of Iroh's jokes but can't set up the punchline. And here, he either doesn't realize the guards are joking, doesn't find typical holistic humor funny, or again, he's too hyper-focused on his own agenda. For a guy trying to not stand out among the prison guards, you'd think he'd at least pretend to laugh at this joke if he knew it was a joke. Zuko has difficulties with metaphorical language. He tries to tell Sokka to look for the silver lining, but instead tells him to take a bite out of the silver sandwich. Zuko understands this idiom is for cheering people up, but he's confused by the idiom itself. Zuko isn't usually deliberately rude, but he tends to be much more direct in his speech. And even in cases where it's clear he's making an attempt to not be rude, he still says things in a way that could be interpreted that way by a lot of people. Autistic people are known for honesty. While the stereotype that they never lie isn't true, it is true that they usually don't like to lie, and often they're really bad at it. And Zuko is hilariously bad at lying. I already mentioned Zuko has moments where he's nonverbal. 
Other times, he can take a really long time to reply, such as here, where his slow response makes Azula impatient with him. Zuko has to practice difficult conversations before having them. Autistic folks often need this practice to warm up their conversation muscles, as it were, and to work out any kinks. And it's clear from watching Zuko practice this conversation that he definitely needed the practice. Similarly, Zuko talks to himself to work through his own thoughts. He knows Aang is unconscious here. He's using Aang the way Sherlock talks to a skull to work out his theories. Autistic people can struggle to parse through information and know what's important to share, like how Zuko didn't realize the gang should know Ozai's plan to wipe out the Earth Kingdom. Even if he assumed they were going to stop Ozai before then, it's still relevant intel. Zuko falls back on scripted language when he doesn't know what to say. The vast majority of people use scripted speech daily. Hello. How are you? Nice weather we're having. Autistic people, however, depend on memorizing scripted speech to pass as so-called normal. When the conversation goes off script, that's when they struggle. They might stutter, they might take a really long time to think of their answers, or very likely, they may try to apply scripted speech where it's inappropriate. This is where we get some of Zuko's most hilarious exchanges. Zuko doesn't know what to say in these situations, so he quickly searches for the script that fits closest, even if it doesn't really fit. Zuko appears to use other people's words and phrases. Parroting speech can be part of echolalia, which some autistic people have, but it can also be part of mirroring or memorizing scripts. I've already mentioned that he repeats things Iroh says to him, but there are also times where he insults Iroh, using words that, once you get to know Zuko, don't really sound like his own opinions. But they sure do sound like Azula's. Autistic people often have difficulty making appropriate eye contact, whether it's too much or too little. At first glance, Zuko can and does make eye contact without acting uncomfortable. But if you look closer, Zuko often prefers to occupy himself, look at the ground, or even face another direction entirely when he's conversing with others. Zuko also misses cues and forgets to participate in social custom, like here where Uncle Iroh has to remind him to say thank you, or here where he can't figure out from cues that Aang wants to sit with Katara. Now this next point isn't something that Zuko does, but about how others perceive him, which is in line with autism. Due in part to their communication differences, autistic people, especially if they're nonverbal, are often infantilized, gaslit, and thought of as stupid by allistics. Zuko is smart, yet others belittle him. Azula often treats her older brother like a child, she gives him a childish nickname, and she calls him a dum-dum. Zhao is barely capable of deferring to authority, yet delights in mocking Zuko. Sokka calls Zuko stupid to his face. Although, to be fair, Zuko did kind of set himself up for this one. And later on, Aang indicates that the entire gang thinks Zuko is stupid when he says, I don't care what everyone else says about you, you're pretty smart. While I laugh at Zuko's reaction here every time, this constantly being underestimated and undervalued will feel painfully familiar to autistic people. Honestly, there are probably a lot more examples that I'm forgetting, but I think we have enough to go by here. By now, it should come as no surprise that autistic people often understand and make relationships in different ways from neurotypicals. Autistic people often mask, and no, I'm not referring to wearing their N95s or even to this. Masking is hiding their autistic behaviors and adopting neurotypical ones to fly under the radar. Masking can lead to identity issues where they've hidden their own self until they're not sure who they really are, a problem Uncle Iroh clearly thinks Zuko struggles with. There are many ways autistic people mask, but a common way is through mirroring, which is when they identify a specific person they want to emulate and then imitate their dress, speech, or mannerisms. Now this requires me to read between the lines a bit, but I think Zuko actually does quite a bit of mirroring. Season 1 Zuko especially seems… inconsistent, saying one thing while doing another. But if Zuko is mirroring someone, this actually makes perfect sense. What Zuko most wants is daddy's love, so he imitates the only one to get daddy's unconditional love, daddy himself. When Zuko says the safety of his men don't matter, he's emulating Ozai. But when he risks his own safety to protect his men, that's the real Zuko shining through. 
The Tumblr I read pointed out that Zuko also mirrors Azula a lot, adopting her humor or demonstrating his firebending immediately after her despite not being ready to do so. But we also see Zuko mirroring others. When Zuko dates Mei, he acts superficial and apathetic when we well know by now that he is passionate, idealistic, and kind of a romantic. But the more he tries to appeal to Mei for connection, the more he emulates her the same way he emulates his dad when he wants daddy's approval. When Zuko later tries to befriend the gang, he also emulates Iroh as a way to bond, telling Iroh's jokes rather than his own, serving tea, even though he has been less than enthusiastic about tea before, and he takes on a similar fatherly role that Iroh took on for him. We also see here, where he's imitating Iroh and Azula, that he does actively observe others and think about how they would act in his situation, especially where he finds his own capabilities lacking. Autistic people, like ADHDers, are more susceptible to rejection sensitivity and might expect to be rejected before it ever happens. When Zuko learns that he wasn't explicitly invited to a war meeting, he obsesses over it, assuming he's not welcome even when he's assured he is, and he preemptively decides not to go. His rejection sensitivity convinces him Iroh hates him. Yes, he feels guilty, for good reason, but even those who barely know Iroh assure Zuko multiple times that Iroh loves him and is proud and will forgive him. Autistic people can also have difficulties understanding social hierarchies and authority. The way Zuko bosses his uncle is a prime example of this, and so is his speaking out in the war room. But what's interesting is that autistic people are often also sticklers for the rules. Once they know what the rules are and why they have value, not only are they more likely to follow the rules themselves, but they may try to make sure everyone else does too. After learning that disregarding the social hierarchy can literally get you burned, Zuko becomes a stickler for that hierarchy. If his authority is challenged, he aggressively attempts to put that person in their place. But autistic people also have difficulty with social nuance, and what Zuko fails to understand is that as an exiled prince, the rules of the social hierarchy may no longer apply the way he expects them to. And when it comes to friendships, autistic people may struggle to make friends or may otherwise form unexpected friendships. Never at any point in Avatardom have we been told Zuko had any childhood friends. What we do see is him hanging out with his mum. When his mum isn't around, he hangs out with Uncle Iroh. When Uncle Iroh isn't around, Zuko clings to his baby sister and her friends. Which is a tad odd for a 16-year-old boy who spent years being independent, has been severely mistreated by said baby sister, who's previously protested against spending time with her, and who doesn't seem to think of her friends as his. But my favorite example of Zuko's relationship differences is that he doesn't seem to know he and Aang are even friends until Aang says it outright in the last six minutes of the finale. Zuko's response is to look away, then look back and say, yeah, we are friends, as though he just realized. Just as autistic people can have trouble gauging social hierarchies, they can also have difficulty determining when someone is an acquaintance versus a friend. Sometimes you might have to directly state the nature of a relationship for an autistic person to fully understand. So yeah, it's safe to say Zuko has some relationship differences. Executive functioning involves our ability to plan, carry out, focus on, and finish tasks. Autism is not the only disorder that affects executive functioning, but there are some common ways that it does, and yep, Zuko's got him. Probably the most obvious example of Zuko's executive functioning capabilities is his autistic hyperfocus. He has a one-track mind, and for years can think only of capturing the avatar. The Tumblr post also points out this moment, when Toph is really excited to hang out with Zuko, and he's just frustrated because she's distracting him from what he's focused on. But Zuko also struggles with impatience, and sometimes puts himself at risk because of it, such as entering Fire Nation territory while he's in exile, attending war meetings while he's too young, learning advanced firebending forms before he's ready, trying to get struck by lightning. One hallmark of autism is struggling with change. Anyone who's seen the show knows Zuko gets upset even with minor changes. The Tumblr blog I read also pointed out Zuko literally gets ill from a big change in his life and needs days to recover. 
How autistic of him. Another hallmark of autism is a need for order and routine. This one isn't as obvious with Zuko, but there are hints that he's very tidy for a teenager. He's also really strict with Aang's training schedule. I ordinarily wouldn't have brought this up, as discipline and routine are encouraged in martial arts, except all the gang are martial artists, yet none seem to care about routine as much. Not even Sokka, the schedule guy. So Zuko's strictness with routine does seem out of the ordinary. Now for this next part, I want you to look at this picture and read the letter. Then look at this one and read the color. If you said H and red, that's pretty neurotypical. Autistic people, however, are much more likely to see S and blue. That's because autistic people have what's called a local processing bias instead of a global one, which is basically a fancy way of saying they tend to look at details rather than the whole picture. This helps them to be great at pattern recognition, which may be why Zuko thinks Aang is a master of evasion when he can't sense a pattern in Aang's movements, or in how he knows how to cheat the pattern to open this door before the solstice. And autistic people may also notice details others don't or make connections that others don't find important, such as when Zuko knows to look for Aang near the river when he learns Katara stole a waterbending scroll, something no one else thought of. But the thing about a local processing bias is that it makes it harder to recognize faces. You need global processing for that. Zuko sometimes doesn't recognize people he's met before, such as Suki, but I'm prepared to give him a pass there since Sokka didn't recognize her either without her makeup, and he'd been playing tonsil hockey with her. But the Tumblr pointed out two interesting things. First, when Zuko challenges Azula, he notices something feels off about her but can't figure out what. Autistic people often struggle to read facial expressions and body language, Zuko being unable to pinpoint what's off about his own sister, despite clear changes in her appearance and body language, checks. The second example is that Zuko has an inaccurate view even of his own looks. Hi, it's 2024 Ray Lin here again. After I first made this video, I have since noticed another aspect of Zuko's character that falls in line with his executive functioning in a really uncanny and fascinating way. As we learn more about autism, and particularly about autistic teens and adults who weren't diagnosed until later in life, we're starting to observe a phenomenon that often happens when these late diagnosed people start the process of unmasking. Effectively what happens is that when they learn of their autism, and especially when they stop masking, they find that for a while, suddenly and inexplicably, they can't do things that they used to be good at. Now there are a number of theories, but no concrete explanation yet for why this happens, but it is interesting to note that Zuko displays what can be interpreted as late diagnosed autistic skill regression. Just think of what happens to him once he's joined Team Avatar and can be more openly himself, when he doesn't have to pretend to be the perfect prince, when he doesn't have to mask quite as much as he used to. Zuko stops being able to firebend and has to go on a field trip with Aang to relearn to bend fire, something he's been doing most of his life. Now I know the writers just wanted an excuse to give some cool world building, to have Zuko and Aang have a team building exercise, and for Zuko to have a healthier relationship with his bending. But it is fascinating that even nearing 20 years after this show first aired, the portrayal of Zuko can still fit in with aspects of autism many of us are only coming to understand now. Anyhow, back to 2022 me. One more aspect of executive functioning Zuko may struggle with is one of his iconic features, his hair. Now as a writer, I understand Zuko's hair is meant to be symbolic of his internal journey toward freeing his burdens. But just as with Dungeons and Dragons, that's the out of character reasoning. There still has to be an in character explanation for why Zuko's hair is so this. Hair is an issue for many autistic people. They may have sensitive scalps, making brushing or styling very painful. They may simply not care or know much about fashion and will style their hair for comfort. They may also struggle to have the energy for a proper hair care routine. Zuko's hair is untidy, ragged, and hangs awkwardly in his eyes. We know the gang has access to combs and hair trimming tools, yet Zuko doesn't even get a trim when he's back in the Fire Nation, where there's more need for him to be presentable, and he likely has servants doing his hair for him. I mean, if you think about it, it seems likely his servants would have recommended a trim, which would suggest Zuko declined. 
Do I really need to point out that even the blind girl who doesn't care about looks and regularly covers herself in dirt still manages to get a comb through her hair to look somewhat tidier than Zuko? I rest my case. Autistic people tend to have intense special interests and gain expertise above and beyond what would be expected for their age. For this reason, children diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, though we don't use that term anymore, were sometimes called little professors. This Tumblr blog suggests Zuko has a special interest in swords, but I'm actually going to push back on that a little. He could have a special interest in swords, I just don't think there's enough to conclude that. He only talks about swords briefly and only when someone else brings them up first. While he's well trained with them, the fact that Tai Li and even Mei are highly trained despite being non-benders suggests ordinary martial training is expected of nobility, which would make perfect sense if the Fire Nation has any cultural memory of the darkest day in Fire Nation history. But I would still say Zuko has an obvious special interest, capturing the Avatar. He has a compelling reason for this, but he's obsessed to the point everything he does is somehow connected. He gets so good at hunting the Avatar, he comes closer to capturing Aang more often than Zhao, who has far more resources and manpower. When Aang goes missing in the finale, despite the fact that everyone else there has spent more time with Aang and in theory should know his habits better, everyone turns to Zuko. Katara calls him an expert at tracking Aang. So it's to the point where Zuko doesn't really know how to socialize outside of capturing the Avatar. Seriously. Special interests are an important part of how autistic people interact with the world and bond with other people. And what do we have here if not Zuko trying to bond by bringing up his special interest? The jury's still out on swords, but I think that we can safely say Zuko has special interests. Stims are so varied that many autistic people think they don't have one because they don't flap their hands or rock back and forth, which are the two kinds of autistic stims that usually get discussed. But self-stimulation as a way to help regulate emotion or excess energy can take many forms. It's also something most people do, not just autistic people. Biting your nails when you're anxious, bouncing a knee, clicking a pen, whistling or singing, playing with your hair. These are all stims. The difference between a neurotypical and an autistic person in this regard is that an autistic person is likely to depend on stims more, and they're more likely to have less socially normalized stims. Not too many of Zuko's behaviors automatically present as stims to me, but he does fidget, he tosses and turns at night, he paces, he firebends to work off heightened emotions, but a less normalized stim he has is talking to himself. Yes, this can be a stim, and it's actually a pretty common one for verbal autistic people. That's all that came to mind, but let me know if you noticed any stim Zuko has that I missed. Our exteroception is the ability to sense aspects of the world around us. Light, touch, smell. Autistic people often have hypo and hyper sensitivities in these areas. It's not uncommon for autistic people to refuse to eat certain tastes or textures, to need the tags torn out of their clothes, or to only be able to wear certain fabrics. We don't get much insight into Zuko's eating or clothing habits. Heck if I know if he's having his royal robe specially made of a different fabric, but we do see him seeking dark and quiet. He also appears to have a pretty good ear, hearing small sounds from all the way across a ship, being woken up several times throughout the series by small sounds that most people never would have noticed. And apart from that, Zuko also doesn't appear to like being touched. Sometimes this is understandable, this is annoying, and this is something he has reason to be sensitive about. But Zuko doesn't appear to enjoy hugs either. He'll put up with and even appreciate hugs to a degree from some people, but even with those people, he seems awkward, uncomfortable, and late to respond. When Katara orders him to join a group hug, he's not pleased. So we don't have a lot to go by, but there is enough evidence to at least give him a couple bars. The final wedge deals with sensing the body's position, a sense of balance, movement, motor skills, etc. Autistic people may be clumsy, and they're also more likely to be hypermobile. Zuko clearly has a lot of flexibility. What is unclear is whether this comes naturally to him or whether he developed it like all the other benders in the show. 
Something we do know, however, is that Zuko is clumsy. Apart from Sokka, Zuko seems to be the most frequent but of the physical comedy jokes. From a writer's perspective, Zuko is a likely target for physical comedy. He's the main antagonist for the first season, he's overly serious, he's awkward, and all those things make it hilarious when he face plants in ways that wouldn't be nearly as funny if, say, Katara did. But again, this comes down to out-of-character versus in-character reasons. When this many jokes are made at Zuko's expense, the conclusion viewers are forced to come to is that he's clumsy. But this isn't just me reading too deeply into a couple of jokes. We're specifically shown that Zuko was a clumsy child. It isn't just that he isn't as prodigious at bending as Azula, despite having had a full year's head start on her when it comes to his training, but it's that he trips over his own feet doing basic moves twice. At the beginning of the series, we also have Uncle Iroh telling Zuko that he hasn't mastered his basics. As a martial artist myself, you're always training in the basics. You never fully move past them. But the way Iroh words this makes it seem like Zuko, despite all of his years of training and despite his incredible display of skill, still struggles with firebending. So my next point does have to be taken with a grain of salt because my source is Ozai, but it may hint that Zuko effectively had a developmental delay, as many people on the autism spectrum can. In the comic The Search, Ozai admits they didn't think Zuko even was a bender when he was born. While Ozai's reasoning for this seems a little thin, Azula didn't have the same problem. It was only at Zuko's mother's urging for Ozai to wait and see if Zuko would later develop firebending that Ozai didn't cast Zuko out of the palace as a baby. Whatever the developmental milestones for bending are, it seems Zuko might not have been hitting them. But there you have it, the last wedge in our autism wheel. Now there is no single autistic trait that won't also be found in the general population. So if you have considered yourself neurotypical all this time and find yourself identifying with one or two of these, you're probably still neurotypical. What makes a person autistic is not one or two traits, but a difference in the brain that results in them having a whole collection of autistic traits. But Raylin, you say, half the things you mentioned were just the writers trying to depict an awkward teen with PTSD, not autism. And to that I say, I completely agree. But in so doing, they accidentally stepped into an area of a Venn diagram that contained autism as well. Autism has a lot of overlap with complex PTSD, even before we get into how common it is for autistic people to also have PTSD. But there are ways to tell complex PTSD and autism apart. This article offers a couple examples. Both complex PTSD and autism may cause a reduced interest in socializing. In the case of complex PTSD, it will be because they are afraid and don't trust people, whereas the autistic person just doesn't find socialization as appealing. Though I would personally argue that there are plenty of autistic people who love to socialize. They just might not know how to do it on neurotypical terms, and they may need a lot of time to recover. While Zuko can have difficulty trusting others, that's justified given he's the prince of the baddies, all but alone in enemy territory. Outside of that context, as already discussed, Zuko actually seems to trust too easily. And from all the other autistic communication issues we discussed, it seems several of Zuko's social issues are autistic in nature. The article also says that complex PTSD and autism both cause difficulty in sharing emotion, but with PTSD, it's, again, because of trust issues, whereas with autism, it's due to difficulties understanding and communicating emotion. And both of those are true for Zuko. He starts off very closed from trauma, and over the course of the series, he gets more and more comfortable opening up. Yet even when he is more comfortable opening up, he still has autism-like difficulty expressing what he's feeling. Zuko has trauma, yes, but he's still autistic coded. It's 2024, Raylin again, back with some more points. So I mentioned at the beginning of this video that I could look at almost every trait we discussed today and explain it away. Any autistic coding the writers may or may not have included would have been purely accidental. But characters have also been accidentally coded as autistic since before autism was even a word. 
Sometimes this happens because the writer is using tropes they don't realize have autistic roots. Sometimes it's because they're basing their character off a real person they don't realize is autistic. Or sometimes it's because they don't realize they themselves are autistic and they're simply writing a character they relate to. Which may just be what happened with Zuko. It turns out that head writer Aaron Ehas and his now ex-wife, Elizabeth Welch Ehas, who also wrote for Avatar, have an autistic son that Ehas has spoken about at conventions. Now, I want to make it clear, I don't know any of these people, and I certainly cannot diagnose them, especially not over the internet. But given the genetic nature of autism, it is reasonable to speculate that at the time that these two wrote for Avatar, one or both of them, whether they knew it at the time or not, may have had personal experience with autism, either because of potentially being autistic themselves or because of having a close autistic relative. These two are sometimes credited for being the most responsible for how Zuko turned out as a character, as they were the writers for the most Zuko-centric episodes in the series, including The Storm, Zuko Alone, The Crossroads of Destiny, The Western Air Temple, The Southern Raiders, and more besides. But regardless of whether the writers intended for Zuko to be autistic or not, at some point, their intentions kind of don't matter anymore. I mean... If I were to write a character that was massively queer-coded, it wouldn't really matter how much I explained, well, straight people can like Lady Gaga too, or, oh, he just really likes rainbows, that's all, or, no, he just goes to the beach to ogle the hot guys in their tiny swimsuits because he's studying male anatomy for his art class. At some point, my explanations stop mattering. People are still going to understand my character as queer, whether I want them to or not. And the more I push against that interpretation, the more I'm likely to upset some of my audience. Autistic people aren't reading Zuko as autistic because they're grasping at one or two flimsy, inconsequential traits and blowing them out of proportion. When you have a character with this many autistic traits on display, is it any wonder people are pointing out that this does, in fact, look, walk, and quack like a turtle duck? But why Zuko specifically? Can't autistic people be satisfied with canonical autistic representation like Dr. Sean Murphy, Sam Gardner, Sang Tae, or Young Woo? The problem with most canonical autism representation is that those characters are usually written and performed by neurotypicals too often without consultation from or the involvement of autistic people. Worse, sometimes these productions get their research from organizations like Autism Speaks, which is commonly regarded as a hate group by the autistic community. Now, I might still enjoy some of these autistic characters, but no matter how well-intentioned the writers and performers are, these characters are often problematically stereotyped, cliched, and continue to spread sometimes very harmful misconceptions about autism. While we, thankfully, are starting to get great canonical autistic characters who are written and performed by autistic people, for a long time, accidental autistic representation has often been the superior form of representation because the writers were more concerned about writing a good, empathetic character, not a walking DSM-5 manual. Discussing autistic headcanons also benefits the autistic community. When neurotypical people listen in on these conversations, it then broadens society's understanding of what autism can look like. Particularly in the case of POC characters like Zuko or Abed, since autism is so often portrayed in the media as a condition for cisgendered, white boys. But gushing over autistic headcanons also allows autistic people to find community, to understand themselves better, and maybe to even accept and value parts of themselves society doesn't. It can also be a way for undiagnosed autistic people to discover their autism and later seek diagnosis. Which is exactly what happened to me. I am a high-masking ADHDer, meaning I have the double whammy of having both autism and ADHD. If you're someone who knows me in real life, finding this out about me for the first time, um... Surprise! The point is, as bad as autism representation can be now, it was so much worse before I got diagnosed. And due to that, my understanding of autism was so ableist, I was insulted when it was first suggested I might be autistic. 
And I refused to seek diagnosis despite pervasive and unexplained struggles I was having at university and with employment. The only reason I consented to seeking an autism diagnosis was because a friend of mine showed me a post an autistic person had written about a manga character that I loved. I am diagnosed today largely because an autistic person nerded out about Elle's non-canonical autism. This is why discussing the autistic coding of Zuko is not only valid, but it might even be really important, and shouldn't be policed. It allows autistic people to recognize themselves and each other, and it expands not only how we think of autism as a society, but also what we think of who's allowed to be heroic in our stories. So, I'm not going to say a lot about the Netflix adaptation. I feel much the same way as what appears to be the dominant strain of criticism. There's some really terrible dialogue. There's some really great fight scenes. There are some weird changes the show made, and there are some excellent additions that actually managed to do some improvement on the original series. But in terms of the discussion of this video, I wanted to talk about changes made to Zuko and Sokka. Despite the writing for the show forcing me to wait until episode 6 before I finally understood what it was that the Netflix Zuko's character arc was supposed to be about, when animated Zuko's character trajectory was at least somewhat understood long before we got to his backstory in the storm, I've really enjoyed Dallas's performance of Zuko. Is probably the highlight of the Netflix series to me. But I can't help but notice that this Zuko, while on paper may seem to be similar to animated Zuko, is in reality an entirely different person. And I think the big difference for me is that this Zuko feels much more neurotypical. He's much more attuned to other people's emotional states. At times, his bursts of anger seem motivated, not an uncontrolled meltdown due to stress and overstimulation, but a deliberate attempt to control someone else's behavior, like when he gets angry at Lieutenant G for gossiping. His speaking out in the war room also felt much more deliberate, as though he'd known he was crossing a social line, but had chosen to insult the general anyway. You also cannot convince me that this Zuko has ever been clumsy. And you also can't tell me that this Zuko doesn't understand metaphors. There's no way he would tell Sokka to take a bite out of the silver sandwich. And I feel that there's something similar going on with Sokka, where Sokka's ADHD coding from the animated series is not coming through so much in the Netflix adaptation. Now, I know this isn't an intentional slight to neurodivergent people. I know that where Zuko's autism and Sokka's ADHD aren't canonized in the original work, there's every possibility the writers for the Netflix series are unaware of those interpretations of the characters. But particularly since the original cartoon was so invested in depicting diversity and inclusion, including disability, it is still a bit sad to see the Netflix series effectively erasing the coding that was part of what made these characters diverse. Again, I know it's not an intentional dig at the neurodivergent community. I'm not blaming the writers, at least not for this. I'm just saying... That's rough, buddy. Anyway... That's finally it for this video. I know in the last video I promised a Thor Ragnarok rewrite, and I do have the writing for that mostly done, but it is going to take a long time to get all the recording and editing done. In the meantime, though, let me know in the comments who your favorite Avatar character is and why it's Zuko. Remember to keep any discussion in the comments friendly. And just as a final note, as I was rewriting a new introduction for this video, Rowan Ellis just dropped a video on autistic representation in media, and she even has a section on autistic headcanons, which is really great timing. So if you want more of this kind of discussion, check out the Tumblr post that inspired this video, and go check out Rowan Ellis's video. Both are linked in the description box. And I will see you next time.